Dear colleagues, dear guests, I would like to welcome you to the quarter past five colloquium by the ETH Library uh, today in English, as we have uh, Professor Sarah Kenderdine as our guest. My name is Anna Petrus, and I will be leading you through today's program. So most of you are already familiar with the format. We'll first hear a 30-minute presentation followed by another half hour where we'll have the opportunity to ask questions and discuss in the plenary. And following this formal part, you are very welcome to continue the discussions at the reception just outside of this room. And now allow me to introduce today's speaker, Professor Sarah Kenderdine. We had the pleasure to meet Sarah already last year at a conference here at the ETH and are happy to welcome her back today for the talk on the topic of Archives in Motion, Digital Collections and Experimental Museology. Sarah is visiting us from the EPFL Lausanne where she is Professor of Digital Museology and has built a new laboratory for experimental museology where they explore the convergence of aesthetic practice, visual analytics and cultural data. She is also the director and lead curator of EPFL's Art Lab, their new art slash science initiative. In her widely exhibited and awarded installation work, Sarah has amalgamated cultural heritage with new media art practice, especially in the realms of interactive cinema, augmented reality and embodied narrative. Today, Sarah will talk about experimental museology as a collaborative research practice for cultural collections, custodians and communities. The presentation will focus on transdisciplinary initiatives which explore cultural heritage from scientific, artistic and humanistic perspectives. Sarah, thank you very much for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much to the ETH Library and also to the organizers of this event. And thank you very much to everybody in this room for coming on such a glorious afternoon to such a speech inside. I will begin quite rapidly because we have a, quite a lot to get through. So uh, about 120 years ago in 1889, the curator at the Smithsonian, B.G. Good, delivered a lecture entitled The Future of the Museum, in which he said this future museum would stand side by side with the library and the laboratory. Convergence in collecting organizations propelled by the liquidity of digital data now sees them reconciled as information providers in a networked world. Media theorists have described this world order as database logic, where users transform the physical assets of cultural organizations into digital assets to be uploaded, downloaded, visualized, and shared. Users who treat organizations not as storehouses of physical objects, but as data sets to be manipulated. Archives in Motion explores how such a mechanistic description can be replaced by the ways in which computation can be experiential, spatial, and materialized, embedded and embodied through various participatory and immersive regimes in galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. It was the CEO of Intel, Brian Krasnick, who said in 2014, former CEO, we're in, the world, we're in the midst of a transformation from a world of screens and devices to a world of immersive experiences. However, we know from media art history that what he was really observing was hundreds of years of development in the prosthetic architectures of the senses. From the Kaiser panorama to the sensorama, the emergence of immersive environments coincided with the sublimation of curatorial practice inside machines and represented the greatest challenge to the passive viewer since the invention of the roller coaster. With Archive 4.0 building up around us, there is a need for new prosthetic architectures for the production and sharing of archival resources. 
Animated archives that emphasize personal effective engagement with cultural memory. David Howes describes that in the 21st century, the multi-sensory is making a comeback. Didactic instruction has increasingly come to be supplemented by multimodal uh, approaches to learning. Disinterested contemplation has been offset by effective participation, and the authority to interpret objects has been redistributed. And so this is where my talk is focused finding strategies for creating and translating digital records into narratives of engagement by which museum visitors virtually re-embody and re-perform the archive or perform the archive. For the last 20 years, I've been designing and building large-scale immersive systems inside museums and then inside universities. I first collaborated with the iCinema Research Center and looking at strategies for um, building this in, uh, infrastructure for museums and the GLAM sector inside university frameworks. I then went on to co-build the Applied Laboratory for Interactive Visualization and Embodiment at the Science Park in Hong Kong, 1,000 square meter space with eight large-scale systems inside. Then returned to Sydney and built the Expanded Perception and Interaction Centre at the University of New South Wales. On the left-hand side, we've got the highest resolution uh, touring full-dome system on the, in the world. And on the right-hand side is a small 7-metre diameter panorama, um, which has 56 projectors and 29 computers. So it's at the edge of human visual acuity, three times higher resolution than any other scientific visualization system um, in the world. So these were, systems were designed to solve um, problems for complexity and, the, and visualization of big data in the humanities and the sciences. That's how such a system is built. Uh, and we're also very interested in... Uh, audio or the sonification of data. Data, as we know, is uh, often the sound of one hand clapping. And so how can we sonify data sets to aid with inquiry as part of this um, overall infrastructure? Um, working a lot on scientific data, this is omics visualization, phenome network visualization from the Imperial College in London and such things as single molecule science and um, single cell microscopy, reducing 53 parameters to a 3D immersive and interactive space. So then I was invited to join EPFL, so I've just uh, integrated a new laboratory which is on 1,500 square meters um, uh, in an old printing factory, so we renovated a warehouse with nine large-scale immersive systems inside. These systems offer us strategies for multi-sensory engagement. They emphasize human-to-human -human as well as human-to-machine interaction and give us powerful ways for this reformulation of narrative that I described earlier. The types of data that we use include billions of points to represent places, such as these heads at Mount Rushmore, scanned by the Scottish 10. We can image precious objects in 3D, and peer inside to see what was previously unseen. We can capture art at super high resolutions that allow us to zoom into the tiniest brush stroke and see more than the naked eye can see. We're subjecting our cultural treasures to various bombardments. Um, this is in a synchrotron X-ray fluorescence bombardment to um, uh, reveal the chemical materialities of this um, Henry VIII painting. We're using um, deep physically based rendering and machine learning to enhance data sets. So this is six hours of photography at Nefertiti's tomb, um, six, uh, three rooms. Uh, so very modest data capture to produce a very high resolution model. And we're also uh, looking at embodied knowledge systems and their archiving through various forms of motion capture and motion over time analytics. So I'm going to introduce you to a few of these projects. I won't do too much theory, but there is a whole body of theory that sits around aura authenticity and the digital object. Um, 
Adam Lowy, the, the conservator, recently described for The New Yorker um, that a digitally recorded copy can be both a load of forensically accurate information and a vehicle for evoking deep emotional response. This is uh, the Dungwang Caves in the Gobi Desert. It's a World Heritage Site at the nexus of the Silk Road, 492 caves carved into this escarpment. Inside 45,000 square meters of mural paintings and over 2,500 statues, crafted by Buddhist monks over a period of 1,000 years, this sublime art treasury is like nothing else in the Chinese Buddhist world. Very important material was found there. This is the library cave, 15 cubic meters of manuscripts, including the oldest book in the world, the Diamond Sutra, the earliest known depiction of the Chinese constellations. Distributed now around 18 countries, they were all removed from the site by explorer archaeologists, and they're being digitally repatriated, if you like, um, by a project run by the British Library. The caves themselves are under serious threat from microclimate change visiting population or visiting numbers going up. Of 492 caves, they have only 30 open to the public now because of this threat. And a massive digitization effort is underway. They have about between 60 and 90 full-time photographers. So it's as a scale that is um, nowhere near... Um, uh, what happens in most World Heritage sites. We took the laser scan from Cave 220 and, uh, and the texture data. These were done 10 years apart. We trained the Dunghuan Academy in um, bringing these two together. But we also, with students for a very modest amount of money, created pure land inside the Magal Grottoes at Dunghuan, which is staged in a 360-degree system which is 10 meters across and four and a half meters high, and it allows about 30 people a one-to-one -one scale experience of being inside the cave. So very simply, there's a laser scan on the um, bottom. You go into cave uh, 220. We simulate what it's like to be there now. So if you do get into a cave, um, you're with about 60 people and a few LED torches, so you don't, in fact, see very much. This cave 220 is permanently closed to the public. It's an early Tang painting. Because it's a digital cave, you can, of course, uh, light up the world. We created a range of um, tools for be, being able to examine the murals in great detail. The black on the, on the faces of these Buddhas is from the oxidization of the paint. The Dunghuan Academy had a big long script of animation um, and also pigment studies. Their artists um, created these um, layers of what it would have originally looked like. We modeled all of the instruments in the painting in 3D. There are 32 musicians in this painting. There are over 4,000 um, musicians in the paintings at Dongwan. And we filmed Beijing Academy dances in a green screen studio and inserted their video into the 3D world. So the fact that this is closed to the public um, in its physical uh, life um, is perhaps a reason for this, but over a million people have seen this installation so far. We then took the um, wireframe from the laser scan and we printed on the walls of an exhibition booth, again, one-to-one yeah, -one scale. This was originally done for Art Basel in Hong Kong when it was the Hong Kong Art Fair. Um, and now visitors pick up a tablet and they walk around inside the digital model. Um, at this one-to-one -one scale, they can examine the murals. It's a very physical installation, uh, kinesthetic um, way of exploring, like a window on the world. What's noteworthy about the interface is the way that it harnesses socialization around a single screen. So museums are obsessed with this idea that everyone should have their own device. And of course, this is um, at the core of the museum experience is this social experience. Um, also, that interfaces need to be for all age groups, young children, middle-aged ladies, grandmother and grandchild, grandmother abandons the grandchild, <laughs> it's tech transfer. Um, and the third most noteworthy quality is uh, this one, wife takes iPad from her handbag and is now filming her husband's virtual experience. 
as if they were really there. These uh, experiences are usually mixed up with, um, with original object shows. So they get uh, curated into spaces with almost no didactic information, but they sit inside these, um, these cultural heritage shows. Um, data like this is very malleable, so we can create, it's a pyramidal cave, so a live interactive um, for the World Economic Forum of that same data. Um, we did a mobile location-based entertainment work in 2015. We were able to walk around inside the cave as well. Um, so it's a very malleable data set. We're also connecting all of our systems together over ultra-high-speed networking. It's something I call the Internet of Big Machines. Uh, and uh, this is a, a part of a, a body of work in new forms of immersive pedagogy. How do you teach using large-scale immersive systems? When it was installed at the Smithsonian, uh, a Washington Post critic said, at last we have a virtual reality system that's worthy of inclusion in a museum devoted to the real stuff of art. And that really is, goes to the heart of the provocation of the digital inside the museum world and changing definitions of an auratic experience. Bruno Latour likes to talk about the migration of aura from real objects to um, digital objects. I come out of the museum world, so I prefer to talk about a proliferation of aura. Anyway, uh, digital, high-quality digital facsimiles are no longer simply a complement to real objects. They have a pro profound and affecting presence in their own right. This work uh, is quite recent, uh, embodying a landscape. It's a collaboration with the National Museum of Australia, the indigenous community um, came to the museum uh, with the problem that their song lines are dying. Um, this particular community come from around Woomera and Maralinga. They're not part of the art market that Australia has created, um, and they're very suspicious of um, intervention. So it was quite a very, very important um, moment. The project itself took seven years to negotiate, and ultimately we had two days on site to document and create a full dome work for them. Um, this includes uh, gigapixel imaging, time-lapsed um, uh, materials, photogrammetry, and drone-based footage. And it narrates um, the story from the perspective of this cave, which has never, ever been photographed. So it's a very, very sacred site. I'm sorry, in this screen, you can't really see how beautiful those blacks are. But um, nonetheless, we then worked with the, um, with the artists as well um, to uh, create another full dome work um, based on these jumpy figures, which are the Seven Sisters, the Seven Sisters song line. They were collected by the museum. We made photogrammetric models of them. They painted artwork for the full dome and uh, then interpreted it for us. And then there's a second work, which is more didactic, um, which also explains the narrative the, um, this particular work was a watershed for indigenous national museum relationships, and it, it won a whole series of major awards last year, and it's destined to tour around in uh, Europe soon. So we often see the way in which objects are removed from context and brought into the museum. So augmenting an object digitally is a way of of reassigning objects um, into some kind of material flow. Uh, this is a portion of the pacifying of the South China Sea pirates. It's um, the icon item in the Hong Kong Maritime Museum, and it tells of the bloody encounters between pirates and government forces in the late 1800s in the Guangdong region of the South China Sea. 15-meter scroll painting, which we scanned at 1,200 dpi. The museum bought a 360 system, and we staged a big interactive animated work for them with real-time sea mists um, in this system. 
But downstairs, the real scroll is um, uh, placed there. And in a very narrow corridor, they asked us to make an interpretive work. And in this one, um, we have a five meter light box, which we printed the image on. There's an LED array around it. You can zoom in and out of this massive resolution image. And it's annotated with a 197 texts that come from two historic documents that talk about every character in the scene. It's a very well-known um, story. Uh, the, that banding that you see is not part of the work. It's to do with the framework of the video camera that's used to capture this. So as you're panning around, these texts are changing. It's also a multilingual work. Another form of augmentation zooming Sydney was done for the train station uh, in Sydney together with the State Library. So for this work, I bought the world's largest gigapixel image, which in 2014 was taken above this building of the Sydney landscape. Um, and in the work, which has many challenges, it has uh, 50,000 people a day see this and they're going up and down these quite enormous escalators. So it moves very slowly, but simply what is happening is you are uh, zooming into specific locations, and then you are augmenting that with views from the historic archive. So either panoramic paintings from a particular location or um, iconic images from, from various points of view. So it conjoins the acts of commuting with the projected movement of this virtual camera as it goes around its own circumlocutory journey to many destinations. And uh, it perfectly matches the peripatetic modes of looking and experiencing that the commuters of Sydney share. While scanning material and working with the State Library, I scanned this for them, which is a fabulous object. It's... Um, uh, 1853 etching of Constantinople done for um, by Henry Barker but for Robert Barker's panorama in Leicester Square so um, wonderful conjunction here for someone who's into panoramas like me uh, and we know exactly where it was etched from so from Galata Tower in Taksim this is a work in production uh, we're printing the etching onto a 360 degree screen and then augmenting it with the gigapixel image taken from the same location. Um, and then that will um, uh, include, can include town planning data, heritage data, literary psychogeography. It's, a, it's an example of what you can do if you have a great extent uh, world like you can in Zurich. And I'm, the panorama collections of Switzerland are quite exceptional. We're also working a lot on how you transform archives in, in these immersive spaces. And uh, this is a work for Museum Victoria. They own a 360 system, and it's an export from the content management system. It took 15 minutes to get all the data. It's 100,000 objects distributed across 18 themes, um, and it uses the metadata to connect them all together. They're distributed by time and in a Z axis to deal with the um, amount of data. Um, it has an emergent soundscape. Uh, the museum has 16 million objects, so it's only showing 0.8% of its collection, so that's why these are so important. If you look at most of the major museums of the world, like the British Museum, it's 0.4%. So, um, it's a way of giving a, a real-time curating machine to the public to surf the um, world of objects. Uh, in a certain narrative, we're talking about the difficulties of connecting the science, the science collections with the humanities collections through the metadata framework. We're also dealing here with indigenous material. And then uh, T Visionarium, which was a work created in 2008 at iCinema, actually sets the precedent for a lot of work we're now doing in moving image archives. As we know, they're the major um, uh, materials produced in the 20 and 21st century. Uh, there are a lot of effort in digitization, but also massive copyright constraints. So very little of this material appears on the internet, 
and we need to create new situated browsers for this material. So this work um, is 24 hours of free-to-air broadcast television footage. It was analyzed by software. Every time there was a camera angle change, there was a cut made in the movie. Database of 24,000 clips of about four seconds each. Four guys are hired to sit in a dark room and hand tag um, these four-second clips with quite idiosyncratic metadata, emotion, expression, physicality, speed. Um, these are quite subjective. Um, and uh, then there were more regular tags like gender and color, which you could potentially you can use machine learning techniques to to tag with now. Then uh, the application distributes 500 simultaneous frames or, uh, or clips um, in the 360 degree space, and then you can operate on the database. So he can go into, uh, every time he selects an image, it goes in and brings everything that's semantically most similar to one side, everything that's most dissimilar is behind him. Um, a whole range of interfaces for this work, um, but he will show you um, how the search might be weighted. So in this instance, color will be selected, um, but it could be um, something that's more obscure, like situation um, or communication. Uh, and this brings all the fiery red stuff to one side and all the black and white or low luminosity material appears behind you. Um, we can also add clips together in this particular work. So it's um, recombinatory narrative or recombining the narrative. And uh, as mentioned, this is um, work that we have ongoing um, also to connect this material to the world of, let's say, open link data to bring internet data into situated settings in conjunction with these archives. Uh, the archaeology of the body is the next section, and it's largely to do with intangible cultural heritage, which, as you know, is socially um, transmitted, enacted, intimately linked to people, and its uh, practices, oral traditions, and performances are defined by their reliance on tacit or embodied knowledge systems. The first of these projects is the Hong Kong Martial Arts Living Archive, um, it is a longitudinal project that um, I started together with the communities in Hong Kong in 2012, but it's still going. And Hong Kong is a reservoir of the most amazing cultural heritage. And, and with the Kung Fu masters, they came through waves of immigration from China in the mid-20th century. So uh, amongst these people were some of the most important martial artists in the world, Jackie Chan, Gordon Liu, um, the stars of Hong Kong cinema. So um, we are doing multimodal documentation. We're working with 33 elite masters, uh, a lot of motion capture data, um, but also their uh, ritual activities and the festivals that, that sort of surround um, these, these systems as well as the esoteric knowledge. This is Oscar, both his father, grandfather, great uncle. They were all superstar Kung Fu masters, extremely fast, extremely precise. So once you have a motion data set, of course, you can um, create a model. You can then annotate the model um, with real-time uh, analytics. Um, left hand, right hand, left foot, right foot, and the Dantian points. Um, it's also connected to Hong Kong cinema. So we're moving from hand-drawn archives to motion archives. Uh, and we find the movements of these 33 masters embedded in the Hong Kong cinema because they were all the fight choreographers for cinema. So there's an interesting archaeology of film um, done as one of the side projects for this. We've had seven exhibitions worldwide on this material. Uh, in the last, since 2015. Uh, one of the um, uh, exhibition modes, I guess, is Reactor. It's a rear-projected, rear six-sided um, uh, 
panoptic system, and you can walk around and look in at this um, Kung Fu Master one-to-one -one scale. Um, it's a fully interactive system where you're changing the, the interpretation or the motion analytics on the screen. Um, as a visitor, you're walking around looking from all points of view. Um, this is uh, animation based on the speed at any point on the body at any um, moment in time. Um, and this is a typical um, particle um, simulation. And uh, the project is also echo echoing advances in labo notation um, that uh, have many repercussions in different forms of um, simulation, serious games, museum exhibitions, robotics, and so on. This is Lam Sai Wing. He was the first uh, Kung Fu master to use photography in studio practice. And the reason that the masters are interested in motion capture is because they're interested in technology for transmission. And so using the photos and the hand drawings that we have of him, we created a 3D model of him and then applied the motion data set from his great-great-grandnephew, Oscar. So this stands at life size in the gallery. Um, I mean, it's, it's a very stylized chi building exercise, actually. Uh, pose matching, so um, the way in which embodied and performed acts generate, record, and transmit knowledge um, for the viewer can be through these kinds of simulated um, experiences where they try to match their body to uh, or reenact the gesture on display. There's a lot of theory that sits around all of this, which I won't go into. Uh, 1,000 frame a second video and 500 frame a second video, Yao Wen Wa here. A linear navigator, we've documented all of the weapons training. They have very crude weapons, um, often uh, just iron bars and so on, because they were mainly poor farmers. Um, but we have documented all. We use 360 video uh, and drone-based video of the rituals. And this is a Jiao festival that happens once every 10 years. Um, and we're also connecting to the whole spread of um, Kung Fu around the world, in this case through the post Ghanis posters, um, which were hand-painted in Ghana. And then um, you can see here in the streets, and then the movie is shown on a little TV set. This is Hong Kong in the 1970s. This is a clan um, meeting in Hong Kong, but today it looks like this. So it's all Europeans, Australians, and Americans learning uh, Kung Fu. You see Master Lam in the middle here. Um, part of the work that we've been starting to do is also connect this to European reenactment martial arts um, materials. These are um, the reenactment world is based on close reading of 16th century and 15th century manuscripts and then the move is, um, the moves are reperformed by elite practitioners and uh, we're running a project that's comparative analysis between these 16th century um, documents and the embodied moves of these characters you can see this is an Italian reenactment group who came to a conference I was running um, in embodied knowledge. It's extremely um, sophisticated. So all of these works, and perhaps this is a good time to say it, um, are imbued with the idea that Homi Baba so eloquently describes, and that is the borderline work of culture demands an encounter with newness that's not part of the continuum of the past and the present. It creates a sense of the new as an insurgent act of cultural translation. Such art does not merely recall the past as a social cause or an aesthetic precedent. It renews the past, refiguring it as an in-between space that innovates and interrupts the performance of the present. The past-present becomes part of the necessity, not the nostalgia of living.
so the next project is a, a reenactment project, um, remaking the Confucian rites, also a long-term archiving project um, in embodied knowledge, if you, if you like. It's together with Tsinghua University in Beijing and in particular Professor Pang, who is the Professor of Ritual Studies. Um, and it's in collaboration with City University of Hong Kong and also Jialin Hall. And we've embarked on this process of, uh, well, Pang has, of close reading of a 5th century version of the manuscript. Um, Confucianism, as you know, or Confucius, had a set of etiquettes and rules for societal behavior. And in particular, we're interested in the concept of Li um, and uh, how it runs through um, uh, society. It's an aesthetics of politics as opposed to a politicized aesthetics. So the book of etiquette and rites, Yi Li, is at the core of the traditional Confucian canon. There are 17 rituals. They're written in a performance manual style, so every movement is described. And they were passed down through generations and recorded also the vivid life, um, social life in China. Um, they fell, they became very difficult to interpret. Um, there were various uh, written down versions. Um, but then ultimately in 1911, in the Chinese um, Republican Revolution, they were, they were banned. Um, they still operated at folk level. And then in the 1950s onwards, um, you could be um, uh, put in prison for, for enacting these rituals. Um, but even so, it's still recognized as having great academic uh, and cultural value. And of course, the Chinese government are increasingly interested in Confucianism as a legitimization for, from their own perspective of, of world order, and certainly that in China. So it's about a, uh, describing a socio-political uh, future in harmony with the philosophical and ethical past. So uh, this is Pang's team. He's close reading this document every day um, from this really heavy scholastic word-by-word -word interpretation. He uh, builds all of the costumes. He creates all of the ritual objects. And then we bring uh, the Beijing opera in to perform. Um, and we capture them from a whole range of multimodal um, perspectives, ultimately to create um, innovative visualization solutions that allow for the highest interpretation um, uh, of these materials that can be interactively studied. And you see the beginnings of a website that we are making here. Um, so it is about highlighting our understanding of Lee studies as a system of awareness and practice. It's reflecting on the rapid changes of the Chinese people's sensibilities in terms of their physical body, and it's highlighting the um, potential of art to act as a harmonizing force in attuning ideas to society. Um, this is part of the theory, so I'll skip through it since we don't have that much time. But it's really a meditation on the Chinese modern body and how it was constructed by breaking it down. We can reflect on those um, issues. Uh, it finds its way into various domains. Um, this was for the launch of the China Exchange in London. Um, picked up by the contemporary art world um, into the Slovenia Biniali, uh, and also then in, um, a, in traditional object shows such as the ceremonial vessels at the Art Institute Chicago. Um, this is the most recent shoot, so it was um, the archery ceremony, so we've been doing it since 2012, and we're only up to the third ritual, so we can project out from there. You can see the scale at which we're working, but also moving increasingly to um, a way of creating assets that are not filmic, but are much more gamic. So this is a, a green screen studio where we can rip out the scenery, rebuild everything with CG, and ultimately, I think we can boil it down to six actors, a couple of volumetric video capture systems, and even the costumes, all the utensils will also be in computer graphics. 
here a, a stage is built so the actors can perform, but ultimately we get rid of all of that material. Professor Pang here with all of the costumes um, and utensils, and then him and his team training the Beijing Opera. And then a, a whole range of multimodal uh, techniques for filming them. That you see here. This is uh, the the scenery has been removed. I mean, it's a very early visualization, but the the computer graphics replace what was that um, green screen studio. Uh, using the tonal score, all of the um, music that accompanies, the, in particular, the the rit ritual around archery, um, had to be recreated. Um, and uh, that is that project. And then there's just one more, and I'll change um, to this Atlas project. This is another project that's in production. So it's the Atlas of Maritime Buddhism. It's a shift away back to um, cultural heritage. It's the counter-narrative to the One Belt, One Road that I'm sure you're all familiar with from the Chinese at the moment to recreate the Maritime and Overland Silk Road. So this is the Silk Road in reverse. Actually, it's the Maritime Silk Route. So it completes the great circle of Buddhism. Um, and it's the, about the importance of pan-Asian maritime countries and Buddhist entrepreneurship from the 2nd century BC through to the 14th century. Um, and the way in which Buddhism promulgated trade um, is totally undiscussed in the public domain um, today. So this is uh, a basic map that is South India through Southeast Asia, up into China, down into Korea and Japan. Um, and it triggered a, a whole profusion of cross-cultural exchanges that had a profound impact on Asia and world history and complex processes that involve multiple societies, diverse people, missionaries, itinerant traders, artisans, and medical professions. Sailors were traveling with their votive talisman, and there were also many intrepid monks, especially coming from China to India by maritime routes. Uh, for example, um, Yi Jing uh, is a 7th century traveler, and it took him uh, 27 years to take the route there and back. Along the way, he wrote many, many journals. He described life um, as well as collecting Sanskrit texts and translating them into Chinese. Um, so these are very, very important people in this maritime story. As mentioned, it, it counterbalances the contemporary narratives coming out of the One Belt, One Road project and this Silk Road revival. So this is from the South China Morning Post um, that really puts quite a different time frame and a different narrative on this. Um, we start in the rock-cut caves of India um, and we're doing... Uh, 12 countries, hundreds and hundreds of sites as stereographic panoramas. Um, and then we're connecting it to a multimodal um, database, which is being uh, aggregated by about 50 scholars around the world at Academia Sinica um, to describe this. This is a Shwagadon pagoda in Yangon. Um, I just, it's a Swiss camera, by the way. It's an interesting camera because it's analog. And, um, there are only four of them in the world now, so we own two of them. And it's because it's impossible to take a ultra-high-resolution stereographic panoramic pair out of a digital rig. So it's too slow. This can take a panorama in six seconds, whereas a digital rig is about one minute, if you want 20 or 30,000 pixels, that is. Um, these are just shots. This is um, also from Pagan, just after the earthquake. Gigapixel imaging, um, the earliest known sites in, the, in um, um, Burma. So these are the Pew Kingdom sites, Borobudur, of course, um, the massive temples in uh, Sri Lanka. 
and so on. So this big multimodal archive stereographically is then combined into a gaming world which is not yet built but this will give you an idea you enter into a country or in a country layer that allows you to navigate inside any one of these stereographic panoramas this is from a different work it's india you go inside and then these are augmented with this multimodal database that i was talking about um which is very fragmentary and actually very difficult to bring into the public domain as it's built. So one of the things that I've started to concentrate on are the amazing objects, so Buddhist iconography in all of the, the museums that, in the countries that we're visiting. So a lot of this stuff, of course, is in the British Museum and other great collections, but in those countries who still have um, a majority, this is the um, National Museum in Cambodia and Nom Pan. We're just making high-resolution um, uh, photogrammetric models of all of these statues. Jayavarman VII, Pranjaparamita, his wife, 7th century. Um, this is an Avalokiteshvara from the National Museum in Sri Lanka. And so what we see in this iconography is the way in which these um, bodhisattvas change as they move from one country to another. So the Avalokiteshvara, um, which is... The probably arguably the most important object in Sri Lanka today, um, becomes this Guayan in China um, as it meets the coast of China. So that's it, and uh, it's still in production. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sarah, for this very inspiring talk. And before we continue on uh, to the upper, there is still time for one or two questions from the audience, if there are any. Thank you so much for that great talk. Um, I have a very um, tiny and nerdy question. So my of background course. is in museums and preservation. And I was wondering, um, uh, so I'm, I'm thinking of the caves that you show. And we, we know the caves um, in France, for example, that were rebuilt and that you can uh, explore as a visitor physically and mm -hmm. look at them. So what do you think? How important are senses like, for example, smell or the, the um, sensation of temperature of... Oh vapor, you know, like a, a yeah. damp um, uh, a damp cave or something like this. What are we, you know, is, is our society rather so much concentrating on those little Visual. screens that we, um, that this kind of sensation gets, you know, less important? What, do you, what is your thinking about that? Uh, so we work a lot with... Um, binaural audio, so ambisonics in general. So all of these works have very, very rich spatial soundscapes, 33 speakers in my current panorama system. So you are able to do periphonic localization and, and really immerse people from a sonic point of view. So I think that one solved the, in many respects um, as a technology. The synthetic smell industry is big, yeah. Um, especially in France. And uh, so there's some really great players in that area. And we increasingly see um, works that now are using smell, yeah, which don't mean putting your nose in a jar of coffee beans in a museum, which is a different thing. So synthetic smell is definitely there. Temperature is a bit more complicated because if you're dealing with lots of technology, you're also dealing with air conditioning often and things like that. Um, but the desire for all of this to come together in one experience has been there since they first started painting panoramas where the commentary was, great visual perspective, but I want to feel the wind, you know, from the top of the bridge as I look at the city. Um, and so there's lots of commentary about that. What, what's interesting if you start to deal with stereographic material is it's very different to um, monoscopic from a, from a brain point of view. And uh, so that immersion in the scene is enhanced. 
And there are different ways to do that. So these experiences are also, as I tried to point out at one point, that they're, they're very different to what's on your mobile phone. And in fact, I, I'm not particularly interested in the mobile phone <laughs> as a um, distribution um, because I think we can build very exceptional experiences with all this material. So definitely it's on its way, <laughs> the the total immersive experience. And also the, the, the graphics and things are improving so much, but also our people's expectations. So um, the fact that people are already mobile in most of these and or can interact, um, that kinesthetic stuff is also really important in the experience. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. We have time for even more questions. Yes. Mm, thank you so much for your talk. It's really inspiring. I was just wondering, um, my, her my background is in conservation of heritage, but, but my life has taken me to, to the preservation of a not so nice heritage that is the legacy of war and genocide right. and conflict. Okay. So um, like we at, at work are trying to find ways on how this which is also somehow heritage that we don't want to forget. Yeah, sure. Um, on ways on how to keep on transmitting over generations. So my question is more about if you and your team have had this kind of discussions so or maybe kind of working also on recovering or preserving mm. this type Difficult of things heritage. that are yeah. we should not be forgetting. I don't. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, so I did do a big World War One. Um, visualization with Europeana, but the work that I think most resonates with what you're saying is by what my postdoc. And uh, she, together with um, a, a group of women that were interned in a um, girl's home in Australia over a period of three generations, so 30 years, often it was mother, grandmother, uh, daughter, so all three generations are interned, and terrible, terrible things happen to them. It's just like, and these these people now, they're they're quite elderly. They're in their fifties and sixties. Um, they're very traumatized individuals. There's a um, royal commission into the running of this place, and what um, the women did after really it's a long time, like eight years of discussion, they agreed to tell their story because this Royal Commission was a long time coming um, and their narratives needed to be told. And so they did um, a laser scan of the site. The site is almost is going to be bulldozed as well, potentially. So they've, let, they've done a big imaging project on the site and then worked with the women um, just as narrative voice over of their experiences in particular locations because it was very spatially significant, as you probably know from your work, that every room had a particular terrible thing associated with it um, or type of thing. And so as you enter this, and it's in a big 360 3D system, the one in Sydney, um, which is very, very high resolution, and it's extremely powerful, and they bring... Um, or they can bring the, the juries that sit on these royal commissions into this experience, which is totally different from, you know, reading transcripts, you know, this, this very embodied way of, of going there. Um, so it had, those are the type of projects that are definitely possible, and it's extremely difficult to look at this work. Um, it's not... It's not um, particularly, well, it's not at all pleasant. It's horrible. Um, but it's very, very powerful. And uh, I'm thinking of installing it, it in the Swiss lab just so we can use it for these kinds of discussions, in fact, about how you can start to deal with very traumatic histories in very physically embodied spaces, yeah, because it's, a, it's another level of trauma, um, exposure um, and also the the reception of this material. So the way in which VR enhances these, yeah. Um, so that would be one example. Yeah. Thanks. So now we have time for just one last question before we continue. Thank you for 
this enlightening work. I'm a bit curious how to imagine your process when you start a project. Mm. Is it like you in a little team with somebody knowing especially all the technical stuff what's possible yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, some you having like the art ideas of the concept mm -hmm. or how does it start okay so i've got a lot of technical skills as it turns out so i'm conceiving and building systems visualization systems um, but i'm an archaeologist so i come out of that background maritime archaeology so i can bring these worlds a bit together um, and uh, then uh, on the how these projects are conceived, like the Kung Fu project, they just came to the university I was working in and said, would you do this with us? You know, what can we do? Um, and so that's one access for generating ideas. The others are research grants. So I write a grant and then we go and do the project like this Atlas of Maritime Buddhism. So it's um, a grant written with a number of universities around the world um, and a, a number of museum partners who will then take this um, and install it. So in fact, uh, I think it will be installed here. <laughs> last slide, um, which is the Foguan Shan Monastery, which gets um, a million, uh, 10 million people a year. So it's the largest monastery in the world currently. They'll have a permanent installation dedicated to this um, project. So that's how some are commissioned. Every now and then we get commissions outright, like, will you build us something for this exhibition? So then it's not a research grant, it's more like production. Um, but it's production usually based on a lot of scholarship. Um, and they are long-term projects. And then when it comes to building systems, uh, obviously I'm not the, the person who writes all the code or whatever, um, but the design of the systems and the choice of technologies that go into them, because they're just off the shelf, essentially. It's the software that makes them unique. Um, but uh, we conceive and design those. But then in the university structure, we always have to tender, which is a very risky business when you know exactly what you want um, because you will get many, many responses that are not at that level. So um, you have to figure out how to write and conceive things in a way that you get exactly what you want because there's a very fine margin um, in these things. Um, and what other way do we get work? That's mainly it, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Work, yeah. And uh, thank you also uh, to the audience for participating in the discussion. And we can gladly continue that. Outside, there is a wonderful reception uh, waiting for all of us. And I hope some of you can stay to enjoy and continue this interesting discussion. Once again, thank, thank you very much, much to and Sarah. Thank you to you, really. Thanks. Really great pleasure. Yeah, it was great to have you here. Thank you also for being here, too, for listening, for discussing. And hope to see you outside or otherwise have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much.